tonight as Canada greenlights tanks to Ukraine, a first-hand account of the war. I don't want to die, but there's other things I think about that are more scary. Chris Brown on the front lines with a Canadian medic and his chilling description of all he's seen. Via Rail execs grilled about passenger treatment on a hellish winter train trip. They were still charging us for food when they were passing it out. A slap on the wrist for Home Depot for sharing customer receipts with Meta. They had no reason to suspect that this information would be shared. This is The National with Chief Correspondent Adrian Arsenault. Canada has joined a growing number of Western allies donating tanks for Ukraine's war effort. Today, the Minister of National Defence spelled out the offer. Canada will supply Ukraine with four Leopard 2 main battle tanks. They are just the latest in Western pledges of limitless support, a continuing need made clear again after Russian drone and missile attacks killed 11 just last night. And as artillery continues to batter frontline cities, places like Bakhmut, broken and burning. For Bakhmut, Canadian tanks may matter in the future, but one Canadian volunteer medic is making a difference right now. He spoke to Chris Brown in an exclusive interview about the danger and horrors of the front line. Another As a medic, 36-year-old Brandon Mitchell of Miramichi, New Brunswick, now I transfer to the front to actually do evacuations, has found himself in some of the most dangerous spots on Ukraine's front lines. More than 10 months of evacuating families, helping wounded soldiers, and delivering urgent supplies. I've had several friends that were were personal friends who've died now in this war. So this is uh, this is my war. In August, he was almost hit by a Russian artillery strike as he was rushing to rescue a family in besieged Solodar. A hey, soldier. Thank you. Then, the same day, Mitchell's car struck a cluster of landmines. Ah! I ruptured my, my right tympanic membrane, my eardrum, and um, I'm, I'm told I, I have a traumatic brain injury. Yeah. As artillery boomed around us, we met not far from the besieged city of Bakhmut, which Russia has turned into a bloodied wasteland. Mr. Putin cast his, his country into terminal decline and wasted an entire generation. Because I've seen how they butchered people. I've seen, I've dug bodies out in Solodar. Mitchell also treated Russian prisoners of war from the Wagner mercenary group. He says the man was in rough shape even before he was captured. He was malnourished, he was dehydrated. Um, I have no sympathy for him, but uh, if all those things are true that we hear, um, the best possible outcome for that man that he came to us. A medic's job is exceedingly high risk. Another Canadian, Greg Sekmistrenko, was killed in Bakhmut earlier this month. I don't want to die, I don't want to die. Mm, but there's other things I think about that are more scary. I'm terrified someday that, I, that, that actual fear itself might paralyze me and I might, not, I might not do my job. How many missiles? But Mitchell hasn't just saved lives. His social media postings and fundraising have earned enough to buy 100 generators for Ukrainians living through Putin's power outages. <laughs> Ukraine will win, he says, but not quickly and not without even more help. Chris Brown, CBC News, near Bakhmut. In Toronto today, a response to a surge of violent attacks. Police will now increase their presence in Canada's busiest transit system. I will be clear that we are prepared to scale. And we will scale as required, given circumstances as they unfold in front of us. Now, just hours before that announcement, a subway passenger was shot at with a BB gun. Four teens have been charged. More than 80 officers will patrol the system every day. Via Rail executives called to account before MPs today acknowledge their part in a terrible passenger experience around Christmas. Hundreds of passengers left stranded, confused and furious. Ashley Burke has the details. Just days before Christmas, this is why passengers were stuck overnight on this unmoving train. 
Some ended up calling 911 in the morning, not because of the tree, but because of VRL's treatment. It just sort of felt like you're like a caged animal. It didn't really feel too humane. Casper Baronin was there trapped on board when food and water ran out. Most washrooms were out of service, and he says people hit their breaking point. I think what was really crazy about it was, uh, well, there's a lot of, like, miscommunication. You know, they're like, yeah, an hour and a half longer, and then, oh, maybe three, and then, you know, three hours later. It's like, yeah, so uh, another hour. Uh, that was really frustrating. At a parliamentary committee, Via Rail executives said it was CN's rail line and it was up to its crew to fix it. But Via admitted it failed customers. There was misinformation we offered the passengers. We exacerbated the level of anxiety of those passengers on board. That included sending them an email saying the tree was removed when it wasn't. Obviously, they didn't take it well because they saw that the tree was still there. MPs wanted to know why passengers were left there. And certainly, you know, over the course of 18 hours, one would think we could evacuate a train. We had passengers in a safe place with light and heat and access to washrooms. We couldn't access the train or we couldn't access the train to evacuate them. Via Rail said it wasn't possible or safe to guide passengers along this creek to a nearby neighborhood that had lost power. Passengers, unfortunately, uh, took it upon themselves to detrain from the train that the situation became unsafe. Baronin said the worst part was Via Rail made them pay for necessities. They were still charging us for food um, when they were passing it. That was like salt rubbed into a wound. We were selling food that is against what we normally would have done. Once again, that's a failure on our part and it caused anxiety to the passengers on board. So for that, I apologize. Via Rail said that on top of other refunds and travel credits, that it will now reimburse passengers who had to pay for food and drinks on board that train. Okay, so V is a Crown Corporation. What did the Minister of Transport have to say? Well, Via Rail confirmed today during the committee that Minister, Transport Minister Omar Al-Gabra, that he was not directly in touch with executives when those passengers were stranded. Al-Gabra's office said that he was regularly being briefed, that he didn't want to get in the way of the work that was being done on the ground. But the Conservatives say it's unacceptable that he didn't speak directly with those executives until two weeks after the problem was resolved. All right, Ashley Burke, thank you. Now to an exclusive interview with a couple who rented out their Toronto home, then were shocked to find it had been sold without their knowledge. Tonight, they're calling for stricter rules to verify identities when real estate is being bought and sold. Here's Farah Morali with the anguish they've endured. We own an average house in Toronto. At Derek and Stephanie are still coming to grips with the past year. It's not just financial trauma. It's emotional trauma and like it never leaves you. CBC News has agreed not to use their real names because they're victims of identity theft. The couple moved overseas for work and in 2021, new tenants rented out their Toronto house. Months later, Stephanie logged on to her online banking and noticed their mortgage info had vanished. The bank told them the mortgage was closed. A title search confirmed the home had been sold. The moment we found out it's just cold chills run through your body and you, you can't help but feel an overwhelming sense of emotion. They later learned the tenants with alleged ties to organized crime used fake IDs to rent their home. Others posed as Stephanie and Derek using forged ID, seemingly enough to fool everyone along the way. I think that's what scares you most. You think, oh, like, well, if the bank fails, the real estate board will catch it. Or if the real estate board fails, the lawyer who signs off on the house sale will catch it. So many educated people, it just passes by. People from all different... One piece of government ID creeds, is colors, often all anyone yeah, needs to make a not. large real estate transaction. What we're doing right now is not working. Industry stakeholders say fake IDs are getting so advanced, it's time to demand more verification, like credit score searches and cell phone accounts. Brokers, realtors, lawyers, title insurers, um, everyone who's obligated to look at the identity of someone um, a multi-factor process is going to be much safer than what we're doing right now. The Law Society of Ontario says its verification protocols are consistent with other law groups in Canada. The Ontario government told CBC News it's unveiling a new code of ethics for realtors, but offered no details on anti-fraud measures. 
RICO, which governs realtors, says it's reminding agents to be vigilant. Because of the very lenient penalties. That's um, not enough, say these victims. We need tougher laws. Um, we need the government to protect its citizens more from this type of crime. The couple had title insurance and are close to resolving the situation. But say the ordeal will haunt them for a long time. Farah Morali, CBC News, Toronto. Lots of Canadian renters can tell you how tight that market is. Now there's new federal data to back up their experiences. It shows the vacancy rate for purpose-built rentals fell to just 1.9% last year, down from more than 3% the year before. Among the reasons to key factors, increased immigration and mortgage rates. It's the lowest vacancy rate since 2001, and that's part of what's pushing up prices. It appears that Home Depot shared customer data with a third party for years without their consent. And Canada's privacy commissioner thinks other companies could be doing that as well. As Thomas Degla shows, you may be losing control of your data right at the checkout counter. Shoppers at Home Depot are often asked for their email address at checkout, ostensibly to send an e-receipt like this, making returns easier. Or at least that's what many customers were led to believe. We're busy, we just think we're getting a receipt. I don't really look at any of the fine print that's on the screen. It turns out since 2018, the retail giant was sharing Canadian e-receipt data with Facebook's parent company. As you hear more, more about things like this, it's like, no, I'd rather opt not out of it. In a new report, the federal privacy commissioner slams Home Depot for failing to obtain shoppers' consent. When they were buying at the counter, uh, they had no reason to suspect that this information would be shared. In what Meta calls its offline conversions program, Home Depot sent its customers' purchase information and encoded email addresses. In turn, Facebook used that data to tailor ads to individual users. They're taking these email lists, uploading them into Facebook so that you can retarget your audience. What's more, the privacy watchdog says other retailers may be doing the same if they're asking for your email address. This practice uh, is not consistent with privacy law. It has to stop. He worries in some stores, customer data could be used to glean sensitive details about a shopper's health or sexuality without them ever knowing. I'm certain that other companies are doing this, and this is a wake-up call that privacy is important. It's a fundamental right. The hardware chain told CBC News it stopped using the data sharing tool three months ago once the privacy commissioner raised concerns. Home Depot said it values and respects the privacy of its customers. Thomas Dagg, CBC News, Toronto. Some disturbing video is about to be released in Memphis, Tennessee, showing the beating of a man during a police traffic stop. He later died. Today, five officers already fired were charged with murder. Paul Hunter with how that video is being described by those who've watched it. The video, say those who've seen it, shows police in Memphis beating this man, Tyree Nichols, pulled over in a traffic stop January 7th. It's described as savage. Senior investigators in Tennessee say they've never seen anything so brutal. I'm grieved. Frankly, I'm, I'm shocked. I'm sickened by what I saw. In now laying criminal charges against the five now ex-officers accused, including second-degree murder for each of them, local authorities made their position clear. While each of the five individuals played a different role in the incident in question, the actions of all of them resulted in the death of Tyree Nichols, and they are all responsible. Little is known of what brought it all on, but that the ex-officers themselves are black is notable in a country that has so often seen police violence against black Americans at the hands of white officers. Nichols survived three days in hospital, seen here in a photo released by his family, underlining the apparent ferocity of the assault. It's left many worried, widespread fury will soon turn to violent protests, not least because of this. The city will be releasing the video sometime after 6 p.m. Friday. It will come, say police, with three angles, mostly unedited. On that, this guidance from a lawyer for one of the accused ex-officers. 
Unfortunately, we've all over the last couple of years seen videos uh, where there's police brutality involved. And so uh, I would just caution the public to reserve judgment. The family of Tyree Nichols welcomes the charges and the coming release of that video, urging that any demonstrations be peaceful. Say many, the underlying message is the need for police reform in this country, now reignited as Memphis braces. Paul Hunter, CBC News, Washington. The security situation in Haiti is worsening tonight as protesters stormed the prime minister's residence after recent police killings. More than 100 demonstrators, reportedly including some police officers, torched tires, damaged vehicles, and stormed the international airport. They are demanding tougher crackdowns on gangs. Six officers were killed on Wednesday, taking the total to 10 in the last week. The UN says gangs control about 60% of Port-au-Prince. At least nine Palestinians were killed during an Israeli military raid in the occupied West Bank. The Israel Defense Forces says it went to arrest militants who were planning major attacks. Margaret Evans looks at a deadly day. Palestinian streets crowded again with the living mourning the dead. The funeral of some of those killed in Israel's latest raid on an urban refugee camp in Janine, a flashpoint city in the Israeli-occupied West Bank. At least nine people were killed, including a 61-year-old woman who apparently looked out the window at the wrong time. Both Islamic Jihad and the militant group Hamas said they'd lost fighters. Witnesses describe a frightening scene. We heard gunshots, says this man, and we stayed under siege there for three hours. The Israeli Defense Forces released rare body camera footage of the raid and a statement saying its soldiers were targeting an Islamic Jihad terror squad involved in attacks on Israelis. Palestinian authorities are calling it a massacre. Nabil Abu Rudna is a spokesman for the Palestinian president, Mahmoud Abbas. In light of the repeated aggression against our people and the flouting of signed agreements, he said, we consider the security coordination with the Israeli occupation government no longer exists. It's not the first time the Palestinian Authority has threatened that, but the recent election of an ultra-nationalist Israeli government makes Israeli-Palestinian relations particularly incendiary just now. This man, the new Minister of National Security, wants to annex the West Bank. He's pushing to relax open fire regulations for Israeli security forces. Every policeman, every combat soldier should know they have the full support of Israel's government, he said, after the raid. The U.S. Secretary of State Antony Blinken, expected in the region next week, will no doubt want to de-escalate tensions. But any chance of reviving the moribund prospects of a two-state solution is very nearly out of sight. Margaret Evans, CBC News, London. A deadly cold snap is spreading even more misery tonight in Afghanistan, the country that has suffered so much under Taliban rule, now facing temperatures not felt in decades. Susan Ormiston shows us how it is forcing some desperate choices. Plastic garbage burns, and it's free, so kids in Kabul collect it to ward off this exceptionally frigid winter. Ashur Ali can't sell enough in his shop to buy fuel. The weather's so cold, I couldn't buy coal, he says. Every morning after the prayers, I go and collect something to burn for heat. Cold is not unusual in Afghanistan, but this year, temperatures have plunged 20 degrees lower than average, and the cold wave is lasting far longer than normal. Over 160 people have died, very likely more unreported. The main reason for, for this cold wave in Afghanistan is basically the disruption of the so-called uh, polar vertex. Sadid is Afghan. When the polar vertex disrupts, then the Arctic cooler air is basically moved from the, from the polar area to the, to the other regions. 
a warming ice cap influencing these climate shocks, he says. This winter, actually, it got caught the people unprepared. Extreme weather adding to the misery of economic collapse and with millions here close to famine. People are already at the edge, and this winter is just pushing them further over. Women restricted from most work and school, freezing, are having to make horrible choices for their children. She told me that she had already had to sell one of her youngest to her brother, who is now working in Iran, uh, that she's so desperate, and she utterly regrets that. It's a cruel winter. Still, some kids, even sockless with no boots, have a way of wringing out a bit of joy for as long as they can. Susan Ormiston, CBC News, Toronto. The government has appointed Canada's first special representative to combat Islamophobia. Today, Canada chose to appoint a visibly Muslim woman who is committed to working with allies and communities across the nation to fight hate in all of its forms. In the next four years, Amira El-Gawabi is tasked with providing policy advice. Sunday will mark six years since a gunman attacked and killed six people at a mosque in Quebec City. Today, Al-Gawabi recounted their names. She says all Canadians have a role to play in combating hate. A Canadian fashion brand is looking to make it big in the U.S. I ordered online, and ever since then, I became obsessed. But their expansion may come with a cost. The pros and cons of pointing the finger. This is the Trudeau record. Canadians are hurting. Everything feels broken. How the Conservative leader's tactics could help or hurt him in the long run. Rosie breaks that down with that issue. Poor thing, you got stuck there. A chance encounter and a decision to act. Do you have anything in the car that I could bring up? All part of a moment you don't want to miss. We're back in two. There is preliminary approval tonight to reopen Ottawa's Wellington Street to traffic. The section in front of Parliament was blocked off nearly a year ago after convoy protesters were removed by police. City councillors heard arguments to keep it pedestrian friendly, but the traffic disruption was deemed more of a concern. Today's decision must still be ratified by the full council. A Vancouver-based women's wear company is setting its sights on American fame. Maurizia is well known to Canadian shoppers. Now its popularity is exploding south of the border. But as Paula Duhatchek explains, that kind of meteoric rise can come with big risk. It's clear from her TikTok, Christine Calais loves Aritzia. The Nashville resident had never heard of the brand until a year ago. Now it fills more than half her closet. I ordered online and ever since then I became obsessed. Aritzia has been in the U.S. for years, but recently its popularity has really taken off. Some have called it the hottest fashion chain in the country, and last quarter its U.S. revenue grew nearly 60% compared to the year before. It's surprising to see a new fashion brand coming out of Canada, but it seems to be really working, and in a way it's following the model of Lululemon to great success. Part of what makes the brand unique is it's somewhere between fast fashion and designer. Plus, the brand isn't just Aritzia. It owns multiple different labels that range from workwear and activewear to jeans and jackets. They've been really great at being able to pivot their assortment and really target towards what the consumer actually wants. Now, Aritzia wants to ride that popularity by more than doubling its U.S. business by 2027. We believe in order to be a wildly successful and internationally known brand, you have to be famous in the U.S. Still, success does carry a level of risk. Certainly, it can also become harder and harder to replicate that level of success as you open more and more stores. And unfortunately, we live in a world where investors want to see more and more stores at virtually any cost. Um, so growth becomes the enemy inherently. And expansion in an era of inflation with a looming recession is risky too. Shoppers may start to cut back. It's not affordable with the prices going up. It's, it's just too expensive. Aritzia's prices sometimes don't make sense. 
There may be challenges ahead, but the company says if expansion goes well, the U.S. is just the beginning. Paula Duhatchek, CBC News, Calgary. After the break, Rosie's here with that issue. Hey, Rosie. Hey, Adrian. Tonight, we're going to talk about the warning some economists have given the Trudeau government about an economic slowdown. There's a lot of uncertainty in the world economy. Is Canada prepared for such a slowdown? Chantal, Althea, Andrew and Jason Markusoff join me to talk about that and more. Hi there, I'm Rosemary Barton. Here's what's at issue this week. Canadians are already feeling the squeeze of inflation, and with another interest rate hike this week, the cost of borrowing is going up again. The Liberal cabinet was warned Canada's economy is set to slow significantly this year. We were very, very focused on taking a fiscally responsible approach. There's a lot of uncertainty in the world economy, and we have wanted to keep our powder dry. So is Canada prepared for an economic slowdown? How should the government be preparing? Let's bring in our panelists, Chantelle Bear, Althea Raj, Andrew Coyne, and joining us this week, Jason Markusoff there in Calgary. Good to see everybody. Um, maybe I'll start with you, Andrew. B based on what we saw in the fall economic statement uh, and, and then what the, what the cabinet was warned about this week, i.e. that the slowdown could be perhaps more significant than they anticipated, do you see signs that the government is prepared for this, to take this on, and, and understands what could, be, uh, what could be the challenge in the months ahead? Uh, well, depending on what that means. Uh, <laughs> um, we certainly got a pretty brisk uh, message from the former Deputy Minister of Finance, former Bank of Canada Governor David Dodge, uh, also uh, coupled on that report by Robert Asselin, who used to work for Justin Trudeau as his advisor, both of whom said, uh, if you look at the numbers in that uh, fall economic statement, um, they're outrageously optimistic. Uh, they foresee spending increasing by less than 2% per year over the next few years. If you actually build in uh, what the government has promised, things like increased health transfers to the provinces, things like mm -hmm. 15 frigates for the Navy, et cetera, uh, it's gonna, it, it, it has to come in much higher than that. And if you fold into that a recession or a slowdown in the economy, interest rates staying higher than they might have been forecast to, to, to stay, you could easily see the debt to GDP ratio, instead of dropping majestically down to 35% as the statements uh, projected it, climbing to 50% or higher and staying there. So they've, they've got a kind of rendezvous with reality coming up in terms of their fiscal plan, and I'm not at all sure that they're as seized with that as they should be. And the governor of the Bank of Canada this week, while he said he'll probably keep interest rates where they are, he also said that he saw not much growth, zero growth, really, for the next uh, number of quarters. So, Chantal, wh what are you seeing from the government in terms of them being ready for that? Well, um, uh, the advice uh, that the government is getting from the likes of David Dodge and others is certainly informed advice. But it does run counter to the political reality of this government, i.e., a minority government that does not want to go in an election in the current uh, economic climate, but that is kept in office by a, a, an, a, an ally, the NDP, that wants and is calling for more spending on a variety of mm -hmm. issues mm -hmm. to maintain its support. I was reading and watching David Dodge, who was uh, on Paul Martin's team as a civil servant, top civil servant, back when Paul Martin remember, uh, set a different fiscal course and eventually eliminated the deficit. And I note that uh, David Dodge back then and Paul Martin had the luxury of a majority mandate. <laughs> uh, that is not the case of this government. And that's why I think Christia Freeland, one way or the other, uh, she cannot put the government's survival at risk by becoming Paul Martin in 1995 with that landmark budget. Yeah. Uh, but she will be criticized, obviously, for not following up on the advice that she's getting from uh, such people. Yeah, that, that's a difficult political place to be, Althea, for sure. Yeah, it's interesting to hear her say the government has kept its powder dry because you 
he's like, what powder dry? It, <laughs> it, it is planning I mean, there's to a little spend extra a left. lot more. You know, <laughs> yeah. like, and, and it's not just because of the NDP. It's because of liberal promises as well. You know, like sure. some of the things that the NDP has put um, in their cooperation agreement are things like pharmacare. These are actually liberal promises. So the liberals have promised more money for just transition, more money for defense, as Andrew pointed out, more money for pharmacare, more money for the Canada health transfer. So, you know, the debt is is going to balloon. Um, it is not, uh, this is not going to be a smaller budget by any measure. Uh, so mm -hmm. that is interesting. But she has tried to kind of thread that needle a little bit. Like if you look back in the last budget, she talked about being uh, fiscally responsible, the Liberals' history, basically Paul Martin's history, being um, a, a sound fiscal manager, and that that was something that she wanted to uh, approach. I think the bigger risk for the government is not that the NDP is going to decide to defeat them. It's that the narrative that Pierre Poilievre, the conservative leader, has put forward starts to take hold. We're, we're going to talk more about that narrative in the next block and whether it's taking hold in a, in a broader way. But Jason, your thoughts on, on this? People like to hear the term recession and think, you know, 2008, 1980s. Um, but, you know, this will, this could well take a very, uh, very, you know, different shape than something we're, we're used to. Uh, it couldn't, it might not be 2008. Uh, you know, there, you know, the Bank of Canada forecasts that uh, there is as much likelihood, roughly, uh, for a deep, uh, a deeper hit of a uh, recession, then there is a small increase in the economy uh, this year. Uh, this government, to Athea's point, you know, has these ambitions. They want to, you know, they're still telling parents to expect $10 daycare not far from now. There are still massive ambitions on climate change. The other thing they remember is uh, what worked for them in 2019, 2021, uh, where even the lightest hint or suggestion from uh, conservative leaders of cutting uh, gave them a gift and made them feel very good, saying, what are you going to cut? What are you going to lose? Yeah. Um, and they would still, you know, probably hold that uh, at, in reserve, that are you going to deny people their child care uh, support? Are you not going to fund uh, energy transition? Are you not going to support people's um, Medicare needs? Yeah, th those are certainly some of the things I think we're hearing already. I, th I think you're right about that. But Andrew, is there not a point where the government should say, uh, let me just put aside some of the political ambitions to make sure that we don't end up in, in a really dire place economically? Or is that just me being well, very simplistic about life? <laughs> well, ultimately, that folds back into the politics. So, yeah, yeah. you've got a short-term thing where you've got to deal with a minority parliament. But you also have your reputation with the public to, to husband, and they've got concerns there. It's one thing to go into deficit as a deliberate choice, which they yeah. did in 2015, where you kind of look like you're master of your own fate. But a deficit that you kind of plunge into in the middle of a recession where you look like you haven't really got control of things starts to look like issues, it gets, goes to issues of competence. Chantal? But uh, the last uh, minority prime minister who had to deal with the recession was Stephen Harper. And yep. what did he do? He, he opened uh, the, 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 the vans and, and spent, spent yep. and spent. He was forced but, to. <laughs> but the fact is that uh, in so doing, he wasn't true to form. And so voters were pleasantly surprised and they voted for him. The problem with the liberals is that the spending has been happening since 2015. Yeah. It, that is their default position to spend. And the counter, so they, yeah, the counter example is the early 80s when we went into a big recession and the government spent and spent and they just wound up with bigger deficits than ever and people threw uh, them out on their ear. Yes, yeah, so I'm not so sure though that uh, the fact that uh, the con Constitution was patriated to absent Quebec uh, did not contribute to Brian Mulroney beating the Liberals by winning Quebec. They lost across uh, the country. I would like to think that in a surge of fiscal They lost conscience, across the country by the same margin. Still, uh, it was in, seven, in 79, it was only Quebec that uh, resisted Joe Clark and, and that was lost true patriation. I'm not convinced that, uh, and we're going to get to Pierre Poiliev. Yes. I'm not convinced that because the government gets a bad rap over its fiscal responsibility and, and it, it automatically means voters will turn to Pierre Poiliev. I guess that's where you want to lead us, so I'll let you lead. Yes, we, we, uh, you guys are good this today. You're leading <laughs> me into the next. I don't think you do that very often. Okay, we're going to take a short break. We will be back with that other round of that issue. And you may have guessed by now, we're going to talk about the conservative leader who says Canada is broken. Is that message resonating? That's next on The National.
Welcome to another round of that issue. For months now, Pierre Poiliev has been saying Canada is broken. This is the Trudeau record. Canadians are hurting. Everything feels broken. From passport lineups to delays at airports to rising inflation, the Conservative leader has been quick to lay the blame on the federal government. The Liberals are responding by saying they've solved some of those problems, but also by dismissing Poiliev's attacks as defeatist. That's one of the strengths of this country, uh, and we're going to ensure that that always uh, continues to be, even as, yes, Canadians are facing tough times right now, but the vast majority of Canadians aren't the types to throw up their hands and say, oh, it's all broken. So is Pierre Poiliev successfully tapping into frustration uh, by Canadians that Canadians have? Can he take credit for getting the government to act on any of these issues? Let's bring everyone back. Chantal, Althea, Andrew, and joining us this week, Jason Markasoff in Calgary. Althea, why don't you start us off? Do, do you see signs that this is working for Mr. Poiliev, that, that he is, um, you know, re this is resonating, that he's, he's tapping into something that people are feeling? Um, what do you make of it? I don't think his message has completely gelled yet. Um, yeah. I don't think it's quite clear, actually, even to his own team, who he's really speaking to. So um, he's definitely giving voice to anger that exists out there, but those people are likely to vote Conservative anyways. What is interesting about Mr. Poiliev's message is, yes, he talks about Canada being broken, but if you listen long enough, his videos end with him saying, but there is hope, yeah. and he is the one yeah. that is going to bring hope. I'm not sure people are listening all the way to the end, but it is a dark and gloomy version of the same um, slogan that Justin Trudeau brought us in 2015, where, you know, better is always possible. It's just that the world sucks right now, and if you're feeling pain and there's violent crime, it's all Justin Trudeau's fault, but wait, Pierre Polyev will be there mm -hmm. um, to rectify the whole ship. That message seems to be designed for some people. Is it a message that resonates with the voters that Pierre Polyev needs to have in order to win a majority government uh, mm -hmm. at the next election? Probably not yet, but there are two different visions here that are, I think we're gonna see more and more on that. Yeah, yeah. The, the answer is the government from Justin Trudeau and the answer is not the government and you need to get out of the way from Pierre Polyev. Yeah. And, and fixing it all, Jason, on Justin Trudeau too seems to be, uh, obviously it, it's, it's designed to be about people's frustration or dislike of the prime minister and the hope that that sort of starts to spread like wildfire by the next election. Well, I mean, it's classic opposition uh, technique to blame, you know, everything and make sure every time people get frustrated, um, they're blaming your, your political opponent. I mean, that's just basic thing. Uh, you know, the bow he's uh, wrapping this in with, uh, with the brokenness is interesting. And I think it, it, there's a potential for it to be very powerful. I'm not sure, it can be as uh, sure as uh, Althea that it hasn't gelled yet, uh, is because we're at this very, very unique and difficult pinch point where inflation is, uh, you know, much worse than people's, people can, mem can remember it. Uh, housing costs are, you know, much worse than people uh, have in recent mm -hmm. memory experienced. Um, you know, he's really uh, hitting on the violent crime thing uh, mm -hmm. in the recent days, really trying to blame that on the, uh, on the, on the liberals. Um, but I think that the challenge is that I think people may be a bit cynical about uh, the message, I alone can fix it. Um, mm -hmm. They've heard mm -hmm. it before, um, and unless there are clear signals and a much more hopeful uh, message, I don't know if it uh, if it's going to be uh, going to land as well, or people are just saying, you know, got politicians are being politicians. Chantal. Well, there's a reason why a fourth consecutive mandates uh, or terms are a few and far between in Canadian history, uh, and th that means there is an audience out there that is primed to hear a message different from that of the Liberals. Sure. But um, if you listen to Pierre Poilier's message, everything is broken, etc., etc., it is classical opposition politics. It is auditioning for the role of opposition critic. But there is a, a, a rubber necking quality to it in the sense that uh, this is the guy who is driving slowly and saying, look at the mess they made, but he's not stopping to say, can I give you a hand or here is what I would do. Mm. Uh, and just because voters are more inclined to window shop than they have been in the past three elections doesn't mean that if you show them an empty window and say, my empty window is better than this guy's messed up one, uh, it's going to work. So uh, the real test for Pierre Poiliev is not to convince Canadians that there could be an alternative. It mm -hmm. is to present them with solutions. Mm -hmm. Take health care. Uh, what is 
uh, does he have a plan that's different from Justin Trudeau? What would he do if he were sitting in the place of the prime minister to resolve sure. the Iraq Sam Road uh, flow of, of refugees coming in through there? And I can't, I, I do this all day and I can't tell you what the answer is. Because he yeah. hasn't voiced one yet. <laughs> yeah. Um, uh, uh, Andrew. Well, I agree. He certainly at some point has to start putting forward solutions, or certainly okay. I would prefer that he did. I'm not sure he has to do it right now. It's a pretty effective framing device. You'll notice he doesn't say everything is broken. He says everything feels broken. So he doesn't even have to actually stand behind it in terms of facts. He can just say, well, this is a feeling that's out mm -hmm. there. I would bet they got this out of a focus group. Uh, the best slogans are sometimes come out of what things pe people are already saying. And it does go to this question, this emerging question of, of competence. You know, the knock against this government has always been that they're a bit of lightweights, they're heavy on symbol, light on substance, they're high on their own virtues, not so much on, on actual achievements. Uh, and people are prepared to put up with that as long as they think you're fundamentally not incompetent. Uh, most governments are incompetent, to be frank, because they're trying to do way too many things uh, with a big, huge, clanking bureaucracy. And mostly we cut them some slack. Probably, probably we shouldn't, but we do, as long as it doesn't get too extreme. What causes people to flip on a government and to say, OK, I can't tolerate this incompetence any longer, yeah. is the economy. So the inflation has already, I think, hurt them badly. If we do get into recession, I think they, it could really start to gel uh, where, where, you know, where you really start to make yards in politics as an opposition leader is when all of these separate issues become one big issue. That's right. That's right. And that's what this phrase is trying to get at, I think. But, but, but if, they start, if things start to be repaired, um, and, and Karina Gould was out this week talking about passports being better, like, I, I don't know. But, that, but she was pointing to that. We've resolved it. It's all, does that then start to devalue that, that argument a bit? If the government actually says, oh, he's right, that isn't working, let me go and fix it. Chantal, yeah, you're nodding. <laughs> no, because uh, I think what we're all trying to say is it becomes a competence issue. Right. And you're not going to judge competence on the basis of suddenly being able to get your passport as you should <laughs> always have been able to yes. Uh, yes. in a timely fashion. Yeah. What Justin Trudeau lacks going into the next election at this point is something like the renegotiation of NAFTA, where they looked like an adult government to show voters, see, we are still adults. And, right. and the issues that they're dealing with at this point do not lend themselves easily to that kind of showcase. Well, Althea, could the healthcare deal do that, I wonder? I don't know that we will still be talking about the healthcare deal in 12 to sure. 18 months from no, now. No, that's um, fair, fair, yeah. So I don't think it's gonna be an issue that yeah. will resonate. I think, um, you know, you obviously want the government to deal with the crises at hand, so uh, good on them for, you know, clearing the backlog on passports, but, you know, what have they done on immigration? Right. Um, right. So there's like, more issues will pop up. That's the problem with a government that already has three mandates. And I think Andrew mentioned the economy, but I think ethics is another question where yeah. people can just be like, let, let's vote these bums out because yeah. we are sick and tired of this. And, you know, when you think about the consultancy contracts, for example, and giving uh, contracts to friends or to friendly firms, uh, you know, that is, uh, you get to a point where governments kind of get sloppy. And yeah, yeah. the yeah. opposition is hungry and it will go digging. And I think more issues will percolate to the top that are not necessarily the things we're talking about at the moment. Okay, we'll leave it there. Thank you, everybody. Appreciate you being here. Thanks for joining us, Jason. I'll send things back now to Adrian in Toronto. Thank you, Rosie. Ahead on the national, a moose trapped in a roadside fence. It's okay, baby. We'll get you out. How do you get out of that tangle? A BC couple shows us the way in our moment. A close encounter of a different kind tonight after an asteroid came very close to Earth. The size of a delivery truck, it passed 3,600 kilometers above the southern tip of South America. That's closer to our planet than some satellites, potentially one of the closest flybys ever. NASA insists the asteroid never had a chance of hitting us. Well, on the drive to Pentecost, we get to run into a moose that needs help. Look at it. And back on Earth, this is the moment Kirk Barharn and Angie Hilmer jumped into action. They were on their way to a doctor's appointment in Penticton, B.C., but that was put on hold when the couple spotted a moose tangled up in a wire fence. So even though he is recovering from a broken ankle, Kirk, our hero, scaled the embankment, and with his bare hands, he managed to free the powerful animal. The couple's compassion 
is our moment. It's okay, baby. We'll get you out. I was driving down the road and I noticed uh, moose tracks. The moose tried to jump the fence and got stuck in the wires. Oh, poor thing. She's stuck in the fence. I got out of the truck and climbed up the bank and then got one hoof out of the fence fairly quickly. For that few minutes, it was like everything stopped. I didn't feel any fear. I just figured wanted to see the thing on its feet, not stuck in this fence. It was just instinct, I guess. She's, she's very good. And the second one took all the strength I had because it was quite tangled in the wire. It was pulling the wire plus the hoof at the same time, basically stood up for a second and off it went into the forest. Good girl. Off you go, baby. Amazing. Kirk is our Dr. Doolittle. Apparently he rescued a rooster in 2019 and then adopted him. Good for you. That is a national for January the 26th. Thank you for being with us. Have a good night.